Hello friends, so good to be with you this evening. Got something really special I want to talk to you about. Uh, I kind of want to put it in one word. I, I want to talk to you about complaining. Complaining. I, I, you know, it, seems like, it seems like we're surrounded by so many people who have a complaint about so many things. I want to read you a scripture as I start this thing off. Okay, this is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. And there's also a, a verse in chapter 5 that I'm going to go on and read. But here's what it says. It says, let no putrid, rotten, or unwholesome words come out of your mouth, but rather God's words, which were full of grace, building up everyone who hears them. And then he said there, that's, that's in the last part of chapter four, and then he goes up to chapter five, verse four, he says, but he said, rather as Christians, we should be giving thanks. We should be giving thanks. You know, I, the greater part of this text, it talks about your attitude in speaking. And it opens, it's, it, it opens up by, by saying, let no unwholesome words proceed out of your mouth. That is, no rotten, no putrid words. That was an interesting translation. Now, you might say, why? why? I mean, what's going on there? Well, the fact is, and this is where as I begin to get into this subject, that I want to lay this groundwork to tell you that words play an important role in your life. Words just do. Why? Well, first and foremost, because words are the expressions of who we are. I mean, I, I know the heart of God because he's expressed it to me through his word. And so his word is who he is. And I want to say that your word is who you are. Uh, I believe it was the psalmist that made the statement. He said, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. And, and the Bible also went on and said that we're going to give account for every idle or every, every non-productive word. So these words that you speak day after day, coming in, going out, when you face things in your, you know, on your job, uh, in your career, in your family, whatever the case is, they're expressions of who you are. I mean, who I am sooner or later is going to come out of my lips. And this is what it said there. It said, let no putrid, no rotten. Isn't that amazing? I mean, boy, he's really, he's really laying it out there. Let no putrid, rotten, unwholesome words come out of your mouth. But rather, God's words, which are full of grace, building up everyone that hears them. And again, let me repeat this also in chapter five and verse four. He said, rather as Christians, we should be giving thanks. We should be giving thanks. Now, chapter five, verse 20 said, give thanks always in all things. I mean, thanksgiving really should be the seasoning for your entire conversation. I mean, you, you know, you get this wonderful meal uh, as you sit down at home or you go to a very fine restaurant. And a lot of times what you'll do is you'll get salt or pepper, you'll get some other type of seasoning to put on the food. And it, it, it makes it taste better. And Thanksgiving should be the seasoning for all of your conversation because a Christian's word should express who he is. I, I'm, I, you might say, you're talking about somebody that's saved or born again? Oh, absolutely not. I'm talking about much, much more than that. Uh, a person who is born again, they're a person who's in union with God that sees everything. And I'm talking about people, circumstances. A person in union with God, they're a person that sees everything from God's point of view. And you understand that life from God's throne is being carried out. And so as a result, you trust in God's love and you trust in God's provision. And as a result, that demands that you do what? That you give thanks. You know, to describe you, you are someone who walks among men as one who sees the truth. And everything else is a denial of who God is. You know, I mean, to complain, to murmur about something, quite frankly, is a subtle form of atheism. You're not even sure that God is who he says. And it's just amazing to me that in the midst of his goodness that we find such occasion to complain about this or that, the weather, our country, our church, our job, our family, or whatever. One of the most 
unnoticed yet widespread sins, if we could call it that, is the sin of complaining and, and murmuring, of, of moaning. Um, it's an expression, really, of a lack of trust in God. And I'm just going to tell you right now, any place, anytime you ever find rebellion, you find this problem. Anytime you ever find manipulation, you find this problem. Anytime you ever find discord, you find this problem. Complaining is the product of, or it comes from unthankfulness. And an unthankful heart, I'm just telling you right now, that is a spiritual condition. And it's something you seriously need to be thinking about. I mean, God, God rejected the whole nation of Israel for this sin at one time. They complained and they murmured the whole time that they were in the wilderness before they came into the promised land. And as a result, they couldn't enter in. They, they, they couldn't do that. Now, the, let, me, let me break this down for you. The King James translates it as murmur, but the American Standard translates it as grumble. So, right, let's talk about that. What's, what, what in the world, what does it mean to grumble? What does it mean to murmur? I mean, it's, it, is a, it is a sound word, if I can put it that way. I mean, you can hear it happening. It's a, it's a low tone. You're not really shouting, so you can actually get away with it. You don't really get mad and blow your top. You just mumble at a, at a low tone. It's, it's just kind of a, a sound that comes out in the form of a complaint. And, and it's the idea of a lot of people that's huddled together, talking together and complaining and, and moaning all at the same time. Have you, ever, have you ever been around a crowd or, or heard a crowd and, and they're all complaining at the same time. You can't really distinguish what they're saying, but you hear the sound. It's just kind of a, you know, I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's just kind of a growl, kind of a, a moan. It's a sound. But can I tell you this? God hears that sound too. Because it's the idea of bringing all of our resentments and our rebellion to a boil and our anger provokes us to growl, to grunt at our situation. I'm telling you, this is a real problem that people have today. I'm not talking about people that are wicked. I'm talking about good people who have a problem complaining about everything in their life. They're complaining about their family. They're complaining, they're complaining about everything. On one hand, we've just kind of dismissed it as being negative. You know, that just, quite frankly, I could even say it like this, that being negative comes from an unthankful heart. What that basically says is that God is not in his place with you. I mean, being negative, that's not just the way you are. It's the result of being part of the old sinful human race. It's the part of what was a part of you. So we've dismissed it as being negative. On the other hand, we've kind of dismissed it as being a pessimist. There's a lot of people that they've kind of taken on that role for themselves. I'm a pessimist. Thomas was a pessimist. And, and pessimism, you have to understand, that's not okay. Pessimism is a direct slander against the faithfulness and the keeping power of God. And, I, and I'm just telling you something. It's got to be put away from you. These are attitudes that have absolutely stripped you from the benefits of God's blessings and we do it without thinking. We do it, it's, it's almost like it's become such a part of our life that we just do it without thinking. It's gotta be put out. Um, Ephesians 4.23 said that you're putting off concerning the former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to its deceitful lust. So we gotta put these things off. We do it, we gotta get this thing out of our life. Now you might say, well, why do we do it? Well, it's just simple. You know, the fact is, is that we, we murmur and we complain because, and I can give you several lists of several things here, people haven't done the way, things the way that we planned. I mean, they crossed our little universe without asking. Um, they did what we didn't want them to do. You know, can I just say it again? We, circumstances have not come about as we planned in our all-knowing wisdom. So what do we do? We complain, we gripe. Well, people haven't done what I wanted them to do. And we find ourselves so easily complaining. I'm just, I, listen, I've been with you for a long time 
And this is so covert. This is so hidden that many times this is a part of our life and we don't even realize it. People who have great relationships with God, who love God, but yet they live a life of murmuring and of complaining. I, I mean, this, this, is, this is a really big deal. Now, because the moment that, that we set our hearts, and that's basically, if you're only one of the truth, that's what our words are expressing is our heart. The moment we set our heart against a person because they've not done what I said or because of what I thought or I've set my heart against circumstances and I begin to complain because it hasn't worked out the way that I thought it should, where does that put me? I mean, that's just such a simple question, but it's so true. Well, it puts me in the center and it says this. It says all circumstances and all people, all people ought to circle around me and on this occasion, it hasn't. So my self-centeredness expresses itself maybe without an explosion, but rather in a constant drip, drip, drip of complain and whine. Now that's the bottom line. But, but I really think we need to go back to the big question because this is a big question everybody is, is asking. Who's in control of my life? Who allowed these circumstances in my life? I mean, who allowed these people to walk across my path? See, your complaint, if you really want to get right down to it, your complaint about life is really a complaint against God. It's against God that we grumble and we complain. I mean, if we believe what Psalms 37 said, that the steps of a good man are ordered to the Lord, if we really believe what he said, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart, I mean, you got to stop and ask yourself this question. <laughs> Am I complaining against God? Is that where my complaint has taken me? Psalms chapter 16, it talks about this. It says, the preparations in the heart of man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. But it even goes further than that. When I complain about my circumstances, it's not the way I think it should be. It doesn't match up to my standards. I, I think it should be more I think it should be less. It's not good enough. What am I really saying? I mean, let's let's just get right down, let's get right down to the heart of this right now. What am I saying? I'm saying that as far as my father's love and and care and wisdom and goodness is concerned, there's really something to be suspicious of. <laughs> when it, when it comes to my father's love and his care and his wisdom and and his goodness, I'm, I'm just not too sure about his love. Because if I were God, say, there we go. If I were God, I wouldn't have handled it this way. If I was the one who was love, well, I guarantee you what, I'd, I, I wouldn't have done it this way. See, that's really what complaining is saying. If I was absolute goodness and if I was absolute kindness, I, would have, I wouldn't have handled it in this way. See, murmuring and complaining is to undermine God in our hearts. And this is something that we do so often without hardly ever even thinking about it. I mean, we, we gripe and complain about his love, his care, his goodness, his, his, his kindness, his wisdom. I mean, literally, we slander the very person of God. And that is at the very heart of this harmless little thing called Complaining. Complaining has been around for a long time. I want to kind of give you an example right quickly. Um, you, you've heard of Absalom. Uh, the, the Bible talks about the rebellion of Absalom. Well, how did the rebellion of Absalom actually ever even come into being? Well, as a result of a family disagreement, Absalom was thrown out. He killed his brother, and uh, finally uh, David let him come back in, uh, but he wouldn't let him see his face. Uh, he could come back into the kingdom, but he could only come so far. He had to stay over there, and it really made Absalom mad. And so Absalom set out against his father. Now, he didn't stand on the rooftops and say, you know, David, King David is a louse. Let's just start a civil war. He didn't do that. 
He stood in the gates of the city where, where judgment was meted out. I mean, when David's judges went and meted out judgment, somebody would walk away from those judges. And as they were passing Absalom, he would say, you know what? I, he, you know, he'd kind of dust off their shoulders and say, I, I, that was lousy. If I were king, I would not have done it that way. I, I don't know what's the, I don't know what's wrong with my dad. I, I don't know what's wrong with him. I think he's kind of losing it. I think he's kind of getting senile. If I were king, now since I'm not, it's just too bad. But if I had been, I'm telling you, you would have gotten a better deal with this. And we call that the rebellion of Absalom. But isn't that really what complaining is saying? If I were God, not that I'm pretending to be, of course, we would have gotten a far better deal than this, I guarantee you. And we, we complain, we say the, you know, the, the weather's wrong, the food is wrong, you know, uh, why couldn't it have been more? Why couldn't it have been less? If I had been God, we would have gotten a better deal than this, I guarantee you. But since I'm not, I'm only some stupid little creature who can't do anything. But if I were, we would have gotten a better deal than what we've gotten. And that, my friend, I'm telling you right now, that is at the heart of all complaining. It is the suggestion that if I were in control, the whole human race would have gotten a better deal. That's at the heart of complaining. It is. We're not believing God for his goodness. We're not thanking God for his keeping power. Do, do, do we run into obstacles? Yeah, sometimes we run into things that are devastating, but what we do is, is we confront those things and through the authority of his word, we fix them. We are problem solvers. But people that complain, it's like they're complaining about everything. But I, I, I gotta ask you something, who sends the weather? I see people that complain about the weather all the time. Who's, who sends the weather? Who sends your money? Who sends your food? Who, who sends your possessions? See, ultimately, when you complain, it's a complaint against God, and it's the suggestion that he's not reliable. I, I am telling you, it is this, that, that is at the heart of this thing, this, this simple, harmless thing. You know, I look at Joseph, uh, the Joseph in the book of Genesis, one of the most fascinating stories. You, you've got to really look into that. You know, Joseph was sold into Egypt. He went into Potiphar's house. He went to prison. He later became prime minister over Egypt. But he went through some hardships. But I gotta ask you a question. Was Joseph in the will of God when he was thrown in the pit? Was Joseph in the will of God when he was in Potiphar's house? When they took, when he was lied about and they put him in prison, was, was he in the will of God during those times? Well, I'm just gonna say, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, let me give you another scripture here right quick. I've got this thing for you, I wanna read to you. Philippians chapter two, verse 13, it says, for it is God who worketh in you both to will and do of his good pleasure. And that's what the Bible says. So because of this, he said the next verse, do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless, the children of God without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Do you hear what that's saying? I mean, because I believe that it is God that is at work in my life, I do all things without complaining. And I'm not, I'm not gonna complain about my situation, my circumstances. Philippians chapter four said, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Wow, you gotta, you gotta realize that the, we face things. We face difficulties, challenges, things, things we have to make prayer about, things we have to make supplications about, but I'm approaching those things with thanksgiving not with a complaint. And we've done it for so blooming long that we've just really kind of accepted it as a way of life. It's truth. 
it's a part of our life and we don't even realize it. And that's a shame. It really, it's a bit embarrassing as we stop and think about the things that we've had. Yeah, let me, let me give you another example. Did you know that boredom is a type of murmuring and complaining? <laughs> I, I know, maybe you've never even thought of that. Boredom. Boredom is a type of complaining. You're not satisfied with the life God's given you or the events that he's placed around you. And complaining has spoiled your view to the point that you can't see any good. It's all consuming and nothing, nothing will satisfy. And so you're sitting there bored. You're, you're, you're so out of joint with life that you can't be alive literally every minute. And, and let me just tell you what boredom is saying, okay? Boredom is saying, if I hand a life out to me, it had been better than this. I'm disgusted with my circumstances that have been handed me, and quite frankly, there's not a blooming thing that I can do about it. So with my hands in my pockets and my big, <sighs> I'm bored. Well, I'll tell you what, it's a very, it's a, it's a rebellion. It's a rebellion against God that comes out in a very unique way. Boredom. Boy, I never thought about that, huh? But see, we, we don't. We do these things without thinking about it. As a matter of fact, I, I can give you another kind that, that, that is, is probably worse than that. What happens when I place myself, when I look at me and I place myself at the center of my universe, I'm the one that's in control. I'm going to be the God of my universe because every decent God, they've got to have a, a set of rules and laws. And since I'm better than the other God was, uh, my laws have got to be better. They've got to be stricter. And so when we bring it home, we call it being a perfectionist. Nothing is right. You're dissatisfied with everything. Everything's out of place. Nothing is good. So he just complains and he critiques and he judges. And you know what the problem is, is that th these things have become such a habit in our life and you can't kick it because the reason why you can't kick this habit is because you always feel you're right. See, that's, that's the thing. We, we justify ourselves that we always feel like we're right Therefore, it gives us the license to say or complain about anything we want. Can I give you one more scripture here? Isaiah chapter one and verse three. I, I, I love this scripture. It says, an ox knows the master's crib and the donkey knows where to get fed. You know what that means? Even a dumb animal has more sense than people. I mean, listen, even a dog wags his tail if I put do, food down for him but yet God's people lack the simplest abilities to praise God for his creation. We who are created in God's image and can reason and we can weigh fact against fact, our hearts should be filled with thanksgiving. But it's become a habit, it really has. And it grows until it affects every part of our life. Literally, from the spring shower that that to the fact that our, our clothes aren't ready from the cleaners. We just gripe about all of it. Well, the sun's in my eyes. Well, you know, this could have been better. Well, this should, well, you know, this is, all, all of this traffic is just dry. You know, if unthankfulness take, takes roots, you won't be able to enjoy the simplest joys. You won't be able to. Literally from the sunshine to the birds and the air, to the dew on the grass. <coughs> it, it's like you can't, you can't enjoy any of it. That's what happens. It's almost like, it's almost like uh, something that becomes a part of you and it, and, and, and it just, it's a darkness that just filters through your life until it consumes everything about you. That's, that's what complaining does. You know, I, I think we shouldn't allow that in people and friends around us, but we surely shouldn't allow it in ourselves. We are children. They, they, they kind of raise with a sense of unthankfulness. They don't appreciate what they have. They don't appreciate what's been going on. They, they have the greatest difficulties even just saying thank you. 
You know, we need, I, I feel like we need to attack this thing starting with ourselves and letting it grow out from there that we bathed literally, like I said earlier, that, that, that thanksgiving becomes the seasoning for all of our conversation, for everything that we say. And I just really feel like if you will receive this today, if you will allow this to go in your heart, I promise you, I really believe that this will make a tremendous difference in your relationships and all the things around you. But I'm going to tell you something. It goes deeper than that. It'll, it'll change something in you that will make you walk in fellowship with God. You know, it's, it's almost like people try to walk with God, yet they, they're constantly going against the grain. How do you go against the grain? Anything that you do that is contrary to love is against the grain from God. And that's the reason why a lot of people have so much difficulty getting their prayers answered, approaching the throne of God. You get out of love and you're in trouble. I'm just telling you something. Love is the, the premier, the number one thing that you must have in your life. And so I just want you, I want you, I want you just to take this to heart today. I felt like I needed to, I, I felt like I needed to, to share uh, what it was, but, but what it would do in your life. And you can start by looking around you. You can start by giving thanks for your, for your day. You know, I usually get up in the morning as soon as I walk outside, and I, and I mean this, it's not just something I'm trying to do as a habit, but it's become a genuine thing of gratitude in my heart that I say, thank you for giving me another day. That's so important to me. Thank you for giving me another day. Thank you for this time. Thank you. Thank you for this beautiful weather. And then you can go, thank you for my family. Thank you. I mean, literally everything that you face should be seasoned with thanksgiving. And if you'll do that, I promise you, I give you my promise, it'll change your life. It really will. Well, I, I hope you've enjoyed this. I, I hope this speaks to your heart. That's very important to me. I am going to ask that you please like and share, and if you will also subscribe. I would deeply appreciate you doing that. And uh, I, I want you to know that I am thankful for you, and I mean that. I, I say this to you every time we get together. I deeply appreciate your friendship. Thank you for being my friend. Thank you for being a part of my life. I, I truly lift my heart with gratitude for you. I appreciate you so much. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you next time. Please leave a comment. Let me know what you think. And uh, you can go to my website and uh, I'll, I'll be... I'll be more than, I've got a lot of resources there that I think can be a real blessing. All right, love you guys, and I'll plan on seeing you next time. God bless you. Bye-bye.